Chapter twenty six of seventeen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jonathan Burchard, August two thousand nine. Seventeen by Booth Tarkington. Chapter twenty six. Miss Boke. Nothing could have been more evident than William's difficulties. They continued to exist with equal obviousness when the group broke up in some confusion, after a few moments of animated discussion. Mr. Wallace Banks, that busy and executive youth, bearing Miss Pratt triumphantly off to the lemonade punch bowl, while William pursued Johnny Watson and Joe Bullitt. He sought to detain them near the edge of the platform, though they appeared far from anxious to linger in his company and he was able to arrest their attention only by clutching an arm of each. In fact, the good feeling which had latterly prevailed among these three appeared to be in danger of disintegrating. The occasion was too vital, and the watchword for Miss Pratt's last night was, Devil take the hindmost. "'Now you look here, Johnny,' William said vehemently, "'and you listen too, Joe. You both got seven dances apiece with her anyway, all on account of my not getting here early enough.' "'And you got to—' "'It wasn't because of any such reason,' young Mr. Watson protested. "'I asked her for mine two days ago.' "'Well, that wasn't fair, was it?' William cried. "'Just because I never thought of sneaking in ahead like that, you go and—' "'Well, you ought to thought of it,' Johnny retorted, jerking his arm free of William's grasp. "'I can't stand here gabbing all day.' And he hurried away. "'Joe,' William began, fastening more securely upon Mr. Bullet. "'Joe, I've done a good many favors for you, and—' "'I've got to see a man,' Mr. Bullet interrupted. "'Let me go, silly Bill. There's somebody I, I got to see right away before the next dance begins. I got to. Honest, I have.' William seized him passionately by the lapels of his coat. "'Listen, Joe, for goodness sake, can't you listen a minute? You got to give me—' "'Honest, Bill,' his friend expostulated, backing away as forcefully as possible— I got to find a fellow that's here tonight and ask him about something important before ye gods can't you wait a minute william cried keeping his grip upon joe's lapels you got to give me anyway two out of all your dances with her you heard her tell me yourself that she'd be willing if you or johnny or well i only got five or six with her and a couple extras johnny's got seven why don't you go after johnny i bet he'd help you out all right if you kept after him what do you want to pester me for bill the brutal selfishness of this speech as well as its cold-blooded insincerity produced in william the impulse to smite fortunately his only hope lay in persuasion and after a momentary struggle with his own features he was able to conceal what he desired to do to joe's he swallowed and increasing the affectionate desperation of his clutch upon mr bullet's lapels joe he began huskily Joe, if I'd got six regular and two extras with Miss Pratt her last night here, and you got here late and it wasn't your fault, I couldn't help being late, could I? It wasn't my fault I was late, I guess, was it? Well, if I was in your place, I wouldn't act the way you and Johnny do. Not in a thousand years I wouldn't. I'd say, you want a couple of my dances with Miss Pratt, old man? Why, certainly, yes, you would, was the cynical comment of Mr. Bullet, whose averted face and reluctant shoulders indicated a strong desire to conclude the interview. Tonight especially, he added. Look here, Joe, said William desperately. Don't you realize that this is the very last night Miss Pratt's going to be in this town? You bet I do. These words, though vehement, were inaudible being formed in the mind of Mr. Bullet, and for diplomatic reasons not projected upon the air by his vocal organs. William continued, "'Joe, you and I have been friends ever since you and I were boys.' He spoke with emotion, but Joe had no appearance of being favorably impressed. "'And when I look back,' said William, "'I expect I've done more favors for you than I ever have for any o But Mr. Bullet briskly interrupted this appealing reminiscence. "'Listen here, silly Bill,' he said, becoming all at once friendly and encouraging. "'Bill, there's other girls here you can get dances with. "'There's one or two of them sitting around in the yard. "'You can have a bully time, even if you did come late.' "'And with the air of discharging happily all the obligations of which William had reminded him, "'he added, "'I'll tell you that much, Bill. "'Joe, you got to give me anyway one debt. "'Look,' said Mr. Bullet eagerly, "'look sitting yonder.' over under that tree all by herself there's a visiting girl named miss boke she's visiting some old uncle or something she's got livin here 
and I bet you could " "Joe, you GOT to! I bet that Miss Boke's a good dancer, Bill," Joe continued warmly. "May Parcher says so. She was trying to get me to dance with her myself, but I couldn't, or I would've. Honest, Bill, I would've. Bill, if I was you, I'd sail right in there before anybody else got a start, and I'd—" "'Old oh, man,' said William gently, "'you remember the time Miss Pratt and I had an engagement to go walkin', and you wouldn't have seen her for a week on account of your Aunt Diane in Kansas City if I hadn't let you go along with us?' "'Old oh, man, if you—' But the music sounded for the next dance, and Joe felt that it was indeed time to end this uncomfortable conversation. "'I got to go, Bill,' he said. "'I got to.' "'Wait just one minute,' William implored. "'I want to say just this. "'If here!' exclaimed Mr. Bullitt. "'I got to go. "'I know it. "'That's why—' "'Heedless of remonstrance, "'Joe wrenched himself free, "'for it would have taken a powerful and ruthless man "'to detain him longer. "'What you take me for?' he demanded indignantly. "'I got this with Miss Pratt!' "'And evading a hand which still sought to clutch him, "'he departed hotly.' Mr. Parcher's voice expressed wonder, a little later, as he recommended his wife to turn her gaze in the direction of that Baxter boy again. "'Just look at him,' said Mr. Parcher. "'His face has got more genuine idiocy in it than I've seen around here yet, and God knows I've been seeing some miracles in that line this summer.' "'He's looking at Lola Pratt,' said Mrs. Parcher. "'Don't you suppose I can see that?' Mr. Parcher returned with some irritation. "'That's what's the trouble with him. Why don't he quit looking at her?' "'I think probably he feels badly because she's dancing with one of the other boys,' said his wife, mildly. "'Then why can't he dance with somebody else himself?' Mr. Parcher inquired testily, instead of standing around like a calf looking out of the butcher's wagon. "'By George, he looks as if he was just going to moo!' "'Of course he ought to be dancing with somebody,' Mrs. Parcher remarked thoughtfully. "'There are one or two more girls than boys here.' and he's the only boy not dancing. I believe I'll—' And not stopping to complete the sentence, she rose and walked across the interval of grass to William. "'Good evening, William,' she said pleasantly. "'Don't you want to dance?' "'Ma'am?' said William blankly, and the eyes he turned upon her were glassy with anxiety. He was still determined to dance on and on and on with Miss Pratt, but he realized that there were great obstacles to be overcome before he could begin this process. He was feverishly awaiting the next interranium between dances. Then he would show Joe Bullitt and Johnny Watson and Wallace Banks and some others who had set themselves in his way that he was absolutely not going to stand it. He couldn't stand it, he told himself, even if he wanted to. Not tonight. He had been through enough in order to get to the party, he thought, thus defining sufferings connected with his costume. And now that he was here, he would dance and dance, on and on, with Miss Pratt anything else was unthinkable. He had to. "'Don't you want to dance?' Mrs. Parcher repeated. "'Have you looked around for a girl without a partner?' He continued to stare at her, plainly having no comprehension of her meaning. "'Girl?' he echoed, in a tone of feeble inquiry. She smiled and nodded, taking his arm. "'You come with me,' she said. "'I'll fix you up.' William suffered her to conduct him across the yard. Intensely preoccupied with what he meant to do as soon as the music paused, he was somewhat hazy. But when he perceived that he was being led in the direction of a girl, sitting solitary under one of the maple trees, the sudden shock of fear aroused his faculties. "'What? Where?' he stammered, halting and seeking to detach himself from his hostess. "'What is it?' she asked. "'I got to—' I got to—' William began uneasily. "'I got to—' His purpose was to excuse himself on the ground that he had to find a man and tell him something important before the next dance, for in the confusion of the moment his powers refused him greater originality. But the vital part of his intended excuse remained unspoken, being disregarded and cut short, as millions of other masculine diplomacies have been, throughout the centuries by the decisive action of ladies. Miss Boke had been sitting under the maple tree for a long time, so long, indeed, that she was acquiring a profound distaste for forestry and even for maple syrup. In fact, her state of mind was as desperate in its way as William's, and when a hostess leads a youth, in almost perfectly fitting conventional black, toward a girl who has been sitting alone through dance after dance, that girl knows what that youth is going to have to do. It must be confessed for Miss Boke that her eyes had been upon William from the moment Mrs. Parcher addressed him. 
Nevertheless, as the pair came toward her, she looked casually away in an indifferent manner. And yet this may have been but a seeming unconsciousness, for upon the very instant of William's halting, and before he had managed to stammer, I got to, for the fourth time, Miss Boke sprang to her feet and met Mrs. Parcher more than halfway. "'Oh, Mrs. Parcher!' she called, coming forward. "'I got—' the panic-stricken William again hastily began. "'I got to—' "'Oh, Mrs. Parcher!' cried Miss Boke. "'I've been so worried. "'There's a candle in that Japanese lantern just over your head, "'and I think it's going out.' "'I'll run and get a fresh one in a minute,' said Mrs. Parcher, "'smiling benevolently and retaining William's arm with a little difficulty. "'We were just coming to find you. "'I've brought—' "'I got—I got to find him at—' "'William made a last stricken effort. "'Miss Boke, this is Mr. Baxter,' said Mrs. Parcher, "'and she added with what seemed to William hideous garrulity, "'He and you both came late, dear, "'and he hasn't any dances engaged either, "'so run and dance and have a nice time together.' Thereupon this disastrous woman returned to her husband. Her look was conscientious. She thought she had done something pleasant. The full horror of his position was revealed to William in the relieved, confident, proprietor smile of Miss Boke. For William lived by a code from which no previous experience had taught him any means of escape. Mrs. Parcher had made the statement, so needless and so ruinous that he had no engagements, and in his dismay he had been unable to deny this fatal truth. He had been obliged to let it stand. Henceforth he was committed absolutely to Miss Boke until either someone else asked her to dance, or, while yet in her close company, William could obtain an engagement with another girl. The latter alternative presented certain grave difficulties, also contracting William to dance with the other girl before once more obtaining his freedom, but undeniably he regarded it from the first as the more hopeful. He had to give form to the fatal invitation. "'Mav, this dance to you,' he muttered doggedly. "'Very pleased to,' Miss Boke responded, whereupon they walked in silence to the platform, stepped upon its surface, and embraced. They made a false start. They made another. They stood swaying to catch the time, then made another. After that they tried again, and were saved from a fall only by spasmodic and noticeable contortions. Miss Boke laughed tolerantly, as if forgiving William for his awkwardness, and his hot heart grew hotter with that injustice. She was a large, ample girl, weighing more than William, this must be definitely claimed in his behalf, and she had been spending the summer at a lakeside hotel where she had constantly danced man's part. To paint William's predicament at a stroke, his partner was a determined rather than a graceful dancer, and their efforts to attune themselves to each other and to the music were in a fair way to attract general attention. A coarse chuckle, a half-suppressed snort, assailed William's scarlet ear, and from the corner of his eye he caught a glimpse of Joe Bullitt gliding by, suffused, while over Joe's detested shoulder he could be seen the adorable and piquant face of the one girl, also suffused. Doggone it, William panted. "'Oh, you mustn't be discouraged with yourself,' said Miss Boke genially. "'I've met lots of men that had trouble to get started "'and turned out to be right good dancers after all. "'It seems to me we're kind of working against each other. "'I'll tell you, you kind of let me do the guiding, "'and I'll get you going fine. "'Now, one, two, one, two, there!' "'William ceased to struggle for dominance, "'and their efforts to get started were at once successful. "'With a muscular power that was surprising, Miss Boke bore him out into the circling current, swung him round and round, walked him backwards across the platform, then swung him round and round and round again. For a girl, she guided remarkably well. Nevertheless, a series of collisions, varying in intensity, marked the path of the pair upon the rather crowded platform. In such emergencies, Miss Boke proved herself deft in swinging William to act as a buffer, and he several times found himself heavily stricken from the rear, Anon, his face would be pressed suffocatingly into Miss Boke's hair, without the slightest wish on his part for such intimacy. He had a helpless feeling, fully warranted by the circumstances. Also, he soon became aware that Miss Boke's powerful guiding was observed by the public, for, after one collision, more severe than others, a low voice hissed in his ear, "'She won't hurt you much, silly Bill. She's only in fun.' This voice belonged to the dancer with whom he had just been in painful contact, Johnny Watson. 
However, Johnny had whirled far upon another orbit before William found a retort, and then it was a feeble one. "'I wish you'd try a few dances with her,' he whispered inaudibly, but with unprecedented bitterness, as the masterly arm of his partner just saved him from going over the edge of the platform. "'I bet she'd kill you!' More than once he tried to assert himself and resume his natural place as guide, but each time he did so he immediately got out of step with his partner, their knees collided embarrassingly, they staggered and walked upon each other's insteps, and William was forced to abandon the unequal contest. "'I just love dancing,' said Miss Boke serenely. "'Don't you, Mr. Baxter?' "'What?' he gulped. "'Yeah.' "'It's a beautiful floor for dancing, isn't it?' "'Yeah.' "'I just love dancing,' Miss Boke thought proper to declare again. "'Don't you love it, Mr. Baxter?' This time he considered his enthusiasm to be sufficiently indicated by a nod. He needed all his breath. "'It's lovely,' she murmured. "'I hope they don't play Home Sweet Home very early at parties in this town. I could keep on like this all night.' To the gasping William it seemed that she already had kept on like this all night, and he expressed himself in one great, frank, agonized moan of relief when the music stopped. "'I should think those musicians would be dead,' he said as he wiped his brow, and then discovering that May Parcher stood at his elbow, he spoke hastily to her. May I have the next to you? But Miss Parcher had begun to applaud the musicians for an encore. She shook her head. Next is the third extra, she said, and anyhow, this one's going to be encored now. You can have the twenty-second, if there is any. William threw a wild glance about him, looking for other girls, but the tireless orchestra began to play the encore, and Miss Boke, who had been applauding, instantly cast herself upon his bosom. "'Come on!' she cried. "'Don't let's miss a second of it. It's just glorious!' When the encore was finished, she seized William's arm, and mentioning that she'd left her fan upon the chair under the maple tree, added, "'Come on! Let's go get it! Quick!' Under the maple tree she fanned herself and talked of her love for dancing until the music sounded again. "'Come on!' she cried then. Don't let's miss a second of it. It's just glorious. And grasping his arm, she propelled him toward the platform with a merry little rush. So passed five dances, long, long dances. Likewise, five encores, long encores. End of chapter 26